This is just a weird little video I decided to make. I wanted to share my thoughts. Something that's been going through my brain that's been helping me understand electronics. You might think it's dumb, but that's okay. So electronics is roughly categorized in binaries, AC and DC, analog and digital circuitry, analog and digital signals. An analog signal could be your AC power, it could be your, your audio file, anything that's not digital, and then digital is that. And then AC and DC, generally we think of AC as sine waves and that sort of thing, and DC as digital signals. But I think of it a little differently. You see, there's the idea of a grand unified theory, the ability to just wrap up everything in one tidy package. Physicists love to do this. They want to take this, this glob of math and drop it on a table and point at it and say, the universe is in there. When I think of the difference between AC and DC, or analog and digital, I don't think about what the signals are. I'm not categorizing them by their direct properties. I categorize them by how we work with them. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is working with them. We're doing things with these signals. So it makes more sense to categorize them based on how we work with them. So I say that the difference between an analog and a digital signal is whether or not they're quantized or, or posterized, I believe is the photographic term, where instead of having infinite colors, you might have, you know, 16 colors, good old monitors back in the day, the good old DOS days or before, console terminal colors. And so we work with them either continuously or at, with thresholds. You know, we could have a threshold to an analog signal, but thresholds in a digital signal are giving us those quantization levels, whereas here they're just, you know, clipping for safety or whatever. But that's much less interesting than the AC and DC split. If I give you this, assume those are straight lines. If you look at that, is that AC or DC? It depends on what I tell you it is, is what people are going to answer. But what if I tell you this is just a view of a serial transmission over time? This is just the, the pin of a microcontroller going up and down. Are you really going to call that AC? I do. But a lot of people won't. If I tell you the pin of a microcontroller, they're going to say, oh, that's a DC thing. And if I say, well, here's the pin of a microcontroller over several microseconds, it's like, well, is it AC or DC? See, this is why it has much more to do with what we're doing with it. AC is a changing signal, and DC is a steady state signal. And it doesn't mean DC will never change, but it depends on whether you look at a microcontroller pin at any particular time and then the next time you look at it is a completely separate time. So if you had, let's say, a signal from a temperature sensor, so you've got a variable resistor and you run it through a voltage divider or whatever and you read the voltage, I say that's a DC signal, even though over time you'd measure it and it would be AC, you're not working with the signal over time, you're working with the value at any particular moment. And so that's a DC signal. But if you have audio, obviously you're working with it and you, you can put it through a capacitor and it's the changes. Because if you put a DC signal through a capacitor, if you have silence in your audio file, it's not going to pass that signal through. It doesn't matter if it's biased or not, it's not going to pass it through. You have to have a changing signal to pass it through a capacitor into an amplifier stage, which is the entire concept of AC coupling. So when you're talking about an AC signal, it means you are more interested in the change changes the signal is performing than necessarily the absolute value. And for a DC signal, you care about the steady state, whether it can change or not soon or later. You care about the value and that's it. You don't care about it changing, you're not thinking about it changing. And that's how we work with the signal. So here's the thing. A digital signal, as in a serial transmission, you know, the, the, the square wave. <laughs> Square wave. A digital signal over time, which could be a serial transmission, it could be a square wave, it could be PDVM or whatever. I say this. Every digital signal is actually a square wave of variable frequency. Or every digital signal is a PWM signal of variable duty cycle. Let's say you have a signal that's high. And let's say you change it to high. Well, nothing changed. It's still high, so it just keeps being high. At some point, you're going to change it to low. That's the only change you could make is going from high to low. And then you can say it's low, it's low, it's low, it's low. You can set it to low all you want. It'll be low. You know, from a software standpoint, you might have 
changed it 50 times, but electronically it was just low. So the only thing it can do is change from low to high, and the only information thereof is when it changes. You could even encode this if you had the signal. You wouldn't, you would have to do like the initial value. So we started high. At time zero it was high. And then you just write the times it changes. You say this time, this time, this time. You don't have to write any values, just when it changes, you know when it changes. In base two, of course. So something like this, I think of as an AC signal. I think of it as an analog signal, and it's just something we can work with, something we can filter. Here's a signal. If we go like this, and then we go like this, and then we go like this, that is a digital signal. Here, that is a digital signal. How about this one? That's a digital signal. What do I mean? This is a bouncing switch. If we run it through a retriggerable monostable multivibrator, then we get a nice debounced signal out of it. And I conceptualize this as a form of filtering. If you had an audio signal, you could do the same thing. You could conceptualize this as a sort of activation. Like if you have a spring. Let's say you have you have something on a spring and you push down on the spring and it goes down and as long as you hold it, it's still there. As soon as you let go, it comes back up. So you could view the high voltage as holding up, or in this case, pushing down on the spring or holding up a weight or something. And then the filter you pass it through, if you don't hold it down for long enough, if you don't apply enough force over time, force per unit time, then the signal snaps down and you could do that with any signal. It's a, it's a filter. Think of it, this is a conceptualization. This is a way to think about it. This is a digital signal. Put it through a Schmidt trigger. It's a square wave. It's almost like if you took a square wave and you put it through a few low pass filters, you'd get a sine wave. So it's almost like the opposite operation. If you think of a Schmidt trigger as the opposite of a low pass filter, something that's composing a signal, think about waveform generation. You could take different sine waves of different frequencies, change their amplitudes, compose them to make a signal generator. But conceptually, you can do fancier things like a Schmidt trigger to get a square wave, and that's a filter. That's a, that's a waveform generator or composition, conceptually. It's all about conceptually. This, this is a square wave that's got noise in it. We can run that through the Schmidt trigger too and get our square wave. So in effect, that is actually a low pass filter. Think about decomposing this. You've got the square wave, which is a combination of very high frequency particular sine waves to make a square wave. Because a square wave is made up of a bunch of different sine waves and you just get closer and closer to a true square by adding sine waves. But this is a square wave, which is a composition with additional high frequency added to it. And you can filter that out and you'd say, oh, how would you filter it out? A low pass filter. But that's a specific low pass filter. It's almost like a band pass filter. You've got the frequencies that make up the square wave and then you've got the frequencies that make up the noise and a single Schmidt trigger turns out to be a band pass filter on a noisy square wave. I don't know. I think this is interesting to think about it this way. You may have just decided I've wasted your time. That's okay. You can see the management for a full refund on your way out the door. But if you found this interesting at all, that would be cool. Don't get stuck in a mentality. Don't think of ground as the end of a circuit. Just think of it as another point in the circuit. Don't think of it as zero. Think of it as a reference point, and we just call it zero. This is what they mean. If you've ever heard like somebody who's self-taught or has been taught by a bad teacher how to how to use a sword, you know, in a fantasy book, you know, somebody somebody's trying to get better at using a sword, trying to be a soldier as an adult, and then the the teacher or coach or whatever, sword, sword master, weapons master, say, well, we have to, you have a lot to unlearn before you can learn, that kind of thing. Try to not get in a conceptual rut and think of something as just one way. You know, don't think of the collector of an NPN as the power input. Don't think of the base as the signal input. Just because it usually is, doesn't mean you can't do something else with it. So if you think of something loosely conceptually, if you think of it generally, you'll be more creative and you're more likely to come up with interesting circuits or interesting ways to implement a the circuit. There are 657,894 different ways to make a frequency divider using different analog and digital components. How many can you think of while you do that? I'll be seeing you.